Um, hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Hask. I'm director of the Cornwall Library. And thank you for joining us for this important conversation about affordable housing in Cornwall. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, this event is being recorded so that you can watch it again on our website. It'll be up in a few days. Um, and everyone will be muted during, uh, obviously not the speakers, everyone else will be muted because um, that can cause so much interference with the talk. So if you have questions, please use the chat feature. Um, if you have problems using the chat feature, Shari, good friend, and I are physically in the library. And if you would like to call us and give us your question, we will type the question into the chat for you. So if you're unable to use it or this is difficult for you, give us a call. We'll put the phone number up and we'll put your question in for you. Um, and also we, we may run a little late, but we have a hard stop at 6.15 for, for this, um, this particular event. So I'd like to thank our speakers very much. They've put so much time into this issue, time on the committee and then time preparing for this event as well. And I'm sure we're all very grateful for that. Um, I think you've read all the, the bios, so I won't go into a lot of detail about who's who, but um, Maggie Cooley has been part of affordable housing in Cornwall since the 1990s. And Ingrid Gould Ellen um, is a um, professor of urban, urban policy and planning at NYU. And both Maggie and Ingrid were on the affordable housing town plan steering committee, uh, which you've heard a lot about. And um, Bill McLean is a, a documentary filmmaker and a very skilled interviewer. Uh, Bill will be moderating this conversation. So I think that's enough for me, Bill, if you're right, ready to, sure. to take over. Okay, thank you. Sure, absolutely. So what I wanted to do right at the outset is just give everybody a very brief um, uh, run up to what the uh, housing planning steering committee was. So in, in fall of 2020, Cornwall Selectman appointed the Affordable Housing Town Plan Steering Committee. That's the official name. Um, and this was in response to a state mandate compelling each town in Connecticut to create a plan showing <clears throat> how they intended to achieve the state's guidelines regarding affordable housing. Um, now, this mandate had been on the books for years and without much in the way of uh, incentives or consequences to compel uh, compliance, but in uh, the past few years, it became apparent that the state was going to uh, get more uh, serious about it. And in March of 2020, they, the Department of Housing offered $10,000 grants for towns <clears throat> to develop their plans. Cornwall took advantage of this. Um, uh, securing a $10,000 grant uh, that went largely to um, uh, research and also the work of town planner Janelle Mullen, who was then supervised by the 10 volunteers of the Affordable uh, Housing Town Plan Steering Committee. Um, and then in December of 2021, after much discussion and public outreach, they finalized a plan uh, which gave a, a variety of suggestions and research about how Cornwall could better improve their uh, our uh, affordable housing options and meet the state requirements for doing that. Um, and then essentially that plan was given to the selectmen. The selectmen uh, uh, voted on it and gave it all yays and sent it to the state. Um, it is not a regulatory document. So all, any regulations that need to change in order to accommodate the plan or to move some of the plan's objectives further have to still be and are still in discussion with the uh, among the selectmen and the PNZ. Um, so the goal of today's talk is to give people a better understanding about what the plan's targeted goals are, um, what it recommends, uh, as well as some of the obstacles that might lie ahead in the effort to create more affordable housing in our town. Um, that is essentially sort of uh, the sort of orientation there. And I guess before we sort of get into the specifics, I think uh, both Ingrid and Maggie would like to uh, chat a little bit about why it, this is 
a, a very important thing for Cornwall to be involved in, uh, improving the affordability of, of housing in our town. Um, Ingrid, do you want to sort of start on that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, thanks, Bill. Um, and thanks to the library for hosting this event. Um, I, I'll start just sort of really just very quickly big picture that really across the country over the past five decades or so, housing costs have outstripped income gains. Um, in, in part because we aren't building enough housing across the country. And as a result, it means that people are spending much more of their incomes on housing than they did several decades ago. And, and housing cost burdens are, are, are crushing for low income renters and they're in increasingly squeezing the budgets of moderate and middle income households as well, limiting their you know, spending on, on other necessities and making it impossible for them to save for, for down payments or, um, frankly, for just sort of for everyday financial crises. And, and, and housing costs have, have risen to a point, right, in many areas where adult children are, um, can't afford to live their parent, leave their parents' homes. Many older adults can't downsize and, and continue to remain in their communities and many workers face unsustainable commutes. And, and all this is true in Cornwall too, right? That's sort of the national picture, but all of this is true in Cornwall too. And we're nearly half of renters in, in Cornwall are rent burdened and, and the rising housing prices and the shrinking availability of rental housing are really threatening the, the diversity and inclusivity, I think that so many of us love about, about Cornwall. And so, and so I think creating affordable homes in Cornwall, it would, it would both benefit the Cornwall community by enhancing diversity, but it would also help to chip in and address the broader regional and, and frankly, the national housing shortage and, and affordability crisis. Maggie, what do you, do you sort of have something to add to that? I don't have anything new and different to add to that, except that it's been um, true in Cornwall for well, ever since the housing corp was a dream in the eyes of the, really the board of selectmen and a couple of other interested um, townspeople in the late 80s um, and that it has simply continued to get worse. There was a momentary break during um, every once in a while there's a bad real estate patch and that's good for housing and then it all goes back to climbing values and that's bad for affordable housing and um, COVID exacerbated everything all mm -hmm. over the state, the county, our region, mm -hmm. Cornwall, anything affordable just disappeared. And, and one of the side effects is also that um, it's not just that a wave of popularity snatches up houses, it's that um, those houses will never be affordable again because um, their value increases with each new purchase. And it's kind of an instinct of people who um, buy a new modest house to want to make it larger, which makes it even more out of reach of um, the people served by the housing corp. Mm -hmm. So sure. what's, what's good in our town, I mean, why it isn't just all hopelessly gloomy is that um, the town has always had such a strong feeling about the value of a um, varied population and the strengths that brings to our community. So we haven't had to uh, just plead for acceptance of the idea. All right. So um, this is very much a sort of an interactive talk and we're just basically going to sort of open up for questions essentially right away. And you can do that by going on chat or by calling the library if the chat is somehow not working out for you. Um, and the first sort of question, base question is just simply what are these state requirements and state guidelines for affordable housing in general 
and and what do those numbers look like and goals look like specific to Cornwall? So Maggie, should I jump in on that first and then you'll, no, you can, you can correct me, Never whatever I say that's wrong, but, but I, I, let, let me start sort of just saying by, by the state guidelines, actually, what, what the state formally requires is simply that jurisdictions adopt or amend an affordable housing plan every five years. And um, they do suggest a benchmark, right? It's, it's, it's only a benchmark. It's not a requirement that 10% of homes be, be affordable. Um, in, in every municipality and, and, and what affordable, uh, how they uh, the state defines affordable is, is basically those that are sort of government assisted or deed restricted to, to be, to rent at affordable levels to people that are the households that are earning about 80% of the area, the local area median income or, or below. And, and what does that translate into Cornwall? Well, it varies. It's a little more complicated because it varies by household size. But let's say for a three-person household, that is um, someone earning, um, and, and these get updated every year. So my numbers may be one year out of date, um, but earning less than about you know, $74,000. Um, and, and they would, um, an affordable a rent that's affordable to that to that household would be about um, 1850 or less, like $1,800 uh, dollars or $1,850 or less. So it, you know, again, it varies um, for, for two person households, it would be units affordable to, you know, uh, uh, renting at less than say $1,600 a month. Um, and, you know, the state also counts as affordable market rate units that are rented to people um, that receive housing choice vouchers or tenant based rent subsidies. Um, they also count um, single family properties that are purchased with uh, government assisted low interest, low interest mortgages that must sell under, I think it's, it's like 365,000 or something around there. Um, and, um, and Cornwall currently has 36 homes, I think, that, um, that meet that criteria. And, and overall, there are about um, 1,000 housing units in Cornwall. So Cornwall is about sort of 65 units away from this, you know, would need to build sort of 65 more of these officially affordable units to get to that 10% um, that, um, benchmark. Okay, great. Was that too uh, many numbers, Bill, or did those, is that okay? No, I, honestly, I find that numbers are very helpful. I think mm -hmm. it helps people sort of crystallize exactly the, what, you know, the, what we're talking about when we say affordable housing. Um, so I think about those okay. numbers um, strikes me is um, that even though they are only representing 80% of county median um, incomes, um, the rents, that Ingrid quoted are still astronomical yeah, still um, for the people that we serve. For example, I believe that um, the highest rents at Kugaman, I'm a little shaky about this because they're about to go up 3%, but are like $590 for a three bedroom apartment, which is, you know, extraordinary compared with, and, and that's, that's what's manageable. Yeah. Um, the, the, the rents that Ingrid quoted aren't um, easy for anyone. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't see any uh, questions in the, in the chat yet. I hope Sherry, who's helping me out, navigate that I'm, that I'm reading it correctly. If you've got questions that I don't see, let me know somehow. Nothing yet, thanks. Okay, sure. Um, the next sort of sort of tier, though, I think of core understanding is what are the kind of big bullet point recommendations that the plan recommends that you guys help develop? What are sort of uh, sort of the, the big points that you are trying to sort of see happen? So, I mean, just sort of top line, I mean, the, the plan offers sort of a, a whole variety of strategies to, to try with the, with the and, and we added some numerical goals. Um, I, I don't know, to sort of to, to have something to track and to monitor and to keep, you know, the keep the, the town accountable, which included um, 10 
10 additional units of, of affordable housing. That's a housing that's officially accounted as, as affordable by the state. Um, 10 more units of, of rental housing in general, um, any rental housing, um, because there's there's just so few. I mean, when we were doing this plan, I think in the middle of 2021, we we scanned the market and there were only two rental housing units available in Cornwall and they were renting at some astronomical like $7,000 a month or something. Um, and, and then 10, 10 additional units of, of attainable senior housing, attainable meaning sort of like almost like um, kind of naturally occurring affordable housing that, um, and, uh, and, and then, um, you know, we, we then came up with sort of, um, basically 15 different individual strategies, which, um, which I think can be grouped into sort of five buckets. And maybe I'll just sort of lay out the buckets and then Maggie, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Maybe if you want to talk a little bit in detail about some of those, but, but basically that if you can think of sort of the, the five buckets are, are building dedicated kind of means tested uh, affordable housing, um, number one. Number two, boosting the overall supply of rental housing through what I would say sort of gentle density increases. And most of that is through, um, um, you know, uh, amending the, uh, the, um, the zoning regulations uh, through reform of the zoning regulations. The third is helping people to renovate their homes and in particular helping seniors to, to make um, modifications to make their homes livable, um, like adding a ground floor bedroom or something that, and to help the, to enable them to age in place in their units. The fourth is to help people find and afford housing in Cornwall. Um, and, and the fifth is to educate residents um, and educate the community about the plan and about the associated initiatives. So that's, like I said, the bucket, and then we have sort of 15 strategies within those. So I don't know, Maggie, do you want to pull out a few or? Well, I'd say the, um, the easiest one to achieve and the one that um, is, is the most um, palatable to anybody who's nervous about what this might mean for the town are the ones that are quasi invisible the ones that involve changes within existing structures with no exterior um, alterations like accessory apartments or the conversion of existing houses to um, multiple living units, which are already allowed in our regs. Um, they're there are possible uh, changes that can be made to the accessory apartment regulations, which would make it possible to have more than one on a given lot, um, but that's up to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And what else is easy? The, of course, the way to achieve more housing is to build more housing. And that involves um, construction that is obvious and people are going to see, particularly because um, it's not financially practical to do it in sort of a duplex here and a duplex there, unless you've got some um, extremely uh, rich angel bankrolling that because if you need public money, um, you've got to make it attractive to the public investor. And that means a lower per unit cost, which means more units per building like Kugelman or Bonniebrook. All right. So the um, challenge is to find places where um, something like that can be achieved or something smaller, something with five, six units mm -hmm. in a building that looks like one of the big Cornwall um, houses anyway. So um, I've, I've, got a, um, I've got a question from uh, Anna Tamel um, asking about a committee um, 
or commission the board of selectmen have formed a new committee or commission are you guys familiar with that what that would be i think we're both on it is, is she talking about the the one that the um the selectmen just uh formed that is kind of like another steering committee Probably. to talk about um how to implement the town plan yes it's sort of Gordon's harem. It's all women. And <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That's a colorful. Uh, um, uh, colorful. And it's mostly, I mean, mostly what it's designed to do is sort of to, to flesh out kind of the, the, some of the details in the plan to sort of put a little bit more meat on the bones of, of some of the, some of the recommendations and one in particular is that, I mean, I mentioned both these buckets of sort of helping people renovate their homes and also helping people find and afford housing, say through down payment assistance. So one of the ideas that we kicked around was to create a revolving loan fund in the town. Um, and so we are now, this, this new steering committee is exploring options for how that can be financed, what exactly are the priority, you know, what, what should we be prioritizing? Should it be, you know, allowing seniors to make accessibility modifications for their homes? Should it be down payment assistance? Um, and, and, uh, and, and how exactly should we be, um, you know, funding that? Should we be, um, you know, we, we have some ideas, um, but also, you know, maybe that we, we try to get private um, contributions as well, both Salisbury and, and I think Goshen and Washington, Connecticut, I think in, in Litchfield County all have um, these kinds of revolving loan funds. So, so um, we're going to, we're, I think, mostly going to be, be focused on that. A lot of the plan recommendations, I mean, back to Anna, is that a lot of the plan recommendations also involved, as Maggie was saying, sort of involved um, you know, I, th I think what are ultimately fairly modest reforms to to um, to the town zoning regulations, but that actually could produce um, in in a, I think in sort of a subtle way could end up producing a, a fair amount of additional um, additional rental housing. So um, the in terms of payment and sort of how to pay for these projects. One question that just came across from Michelle Ship is about: <clears throat> Is anyone familiar with Cougarman and Bonnie Brook and how those, you know, how much those cost and how they were paid for? Does does anybody have sort of a? Do you guys are you familiar I with could, those I two could, projects? Maggie is. Um, I can't talk about details of Cougarman much because I wasn't on the housing corp when that um, happened, except that I know the bare bones, which was that the land was bought with um, funds left to the town by Lois and Bill Kugeman, thus Kugeman Village, and that it was built with um, grants from various people, but principally uh, Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, which holds okay. the mortgage still, uh, which is getting close to being paid off. As for um, Body Brook, uh, the housing corporation bought the land that Body Brook sits on, which includes two parcel program lots. Um, and bought that land, including the fact that the price like almost doubled in the midst of negotiations, which was rather scary. But again, open handed people in Cornwall shelled out and we used some of our own money and a lot of uh, contributions um, to buy that land. And then with the help of David Berto, who is the consultant um, that we've used repeatedly and that many towns in the region have used, um, we secured a HUD grant at the at the time it was the last uh, grant HUD 202 grant given, which yeah. um, was just a, a wonderful um, pile of money because it paid for basically everything. Um, once you had the land, you had to make again a substantial contribution to score high on the 
application, um, but it was just a, a wonderful plum and it built Body Brook and continues to support Body Brook, although not quite as lavishly as had been believed before. Um, and that Bonnie Brook, at that point, Cheryl Evans um, uh, became the president of a separate elderly housing corporation with a lot of overlap from the Cornwall, the parent corporation until they were established. And then the people who were on both started just going back to Cornwall housing or just going to elderly housing and now they're totally independent. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a huge undertaking to do a large project like that. I mean, it takes two, three years um, to from start to renting. And that's if you are just on a clear timeline with any kind of interruption like doubling building costs, which is what people are facing now. Um, you know, people have gotten grants and can't use them because um, the bids are now uh, out of sight for what money they put aside for construction. Anyway, it can, t it can take a long, long time, but you um, can't do it without public money. So uh, one quick question um, from Susie Claus, just uh, what are the funding sources for the housing court? Do you guys know? You mean for our just day to day? Yeah. We, um, yes, I suspect. When, so. when we have a project, then we um, go out for public money. Got it. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise um, we trundle along on our own. In the past, um, there was an every other year infusion of money from the uh, house tour, which was stroke of genius of um, people who were ex-board members of the Cornwall Housing Corp. A um, lot of work for that volunteer group, but it, it made a lot of money for us. And then our own fundraising. Okay. Um, there is one, there's a couple of questions on the sort of on the, on the docket now, which is great. I wanted to ask one that had sort of come up in some of our earlier discussions was just about, you know, how, what is the conversation you sort of would have with somebody who says, look, I'm a homeowner and I have sympathy, but, you know, when somebody tells me that rising property values is a, a bad thing, um, I say, well, no, it's not, not for me. I own a home, you know? Um, what is the sort of, you know, and then, you know, does sort of a, a concerted effort to bring property sort of, you know, down to reason or does, does, do I have anything to worry about from an affordable housing project to my own personal sort of uh, bank account in that sense, you know, am I, should I worry about that? No, I would no. rather that thing <laughs> answered this, but um, I mean, the providers of affordable housing have been singing the song for decades about how um, the data all shows that creating affordable housing, in fact, has the opposite effect on um, overall property values. But Ingrid, I'm sure, has all the facts at her <laughs> fingertips. Yeah, well, I, um, I do have to say that this is not about, um, I'm not here to talk about my research, but that's actually is an area where I've done, uh, I've done quite a bit of research. And, and we've actually, just as Maggie said, we've actually found that new subsidized affordable housing can, can actually increase property values, at, at least in urban settings. Um, and and the, the research suggests in lower density settings that new affordable housing doesn't um, has, has no effect really on, on property values, positive or negative. And, and, and the key there really built, I mean, the key is really management and good management and good design, right? You don't wanna live near a poorly managed, poorly designed building of any kind, right? Regardless of, of whom it houses or what people pay to live there, right? 
But housing developments that are well managed and well maintained, like Bonnie Burke and Cougarman Village, are very good neighbors, and they're not going to undermine your property value, so you don't have to worry about it. Good. Okay. Great. Oh. I I was just going to go wider with that. Um, do you have anything you'd rather say about property values, Bill? No, no, I didn't. That was sort of the question. There was a sort of a related one that question okay. just came in about the parcel program. Um, okay, well, I, I think besides, um, you know, strict property values, it's good to also um, think about community values mm -hmm. and um, what, you know, you've got to assume that having affordable housing means that there is an array of residents that wouldn't be there otherwise. And um, you've got to consider the value of all those people who are there um, and the functions that they perform in your town. And one of the ways that one of the ways that I think about this is, um, you know, as as a parent at CCS, you're aware of say your kid is there for nine years, you're aware of a cohort that's eight years older than your kids and a cohort that's eight years younger than your kids. And um, because it's a very tight, intimate school, you know everything about those children. You know how they run, you know how they sing, you know what makes them laugh, um, you know how they mess up. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And then they go on and uh, grow in wisdom and learn different skills and everything. And um, increasingly, they disappear. And when I think of all the value, if you want to have, you know, keep using that word, that those kids could have brought to our town and you just watch them try to find places, go off to other towns. Of course, not every kid who goes to CCS has a burning desire to spend the rest of his or her life in Cornwall, but a lot of them have and they can't. When my daughters were in school, you know, a handful of those kids are still around either in Cornwall or in neighboring towns. My grandson, who left CCS in 2012, I'd be amazed if any of his, you know, 12 year cohort are going to be living in town unless they have family with extra land, extra buildings, extra room, whatever. And that's just a gigantic loss to our town. Well, well said. So, um, one question here is asking, how does the parcel program factor into the housing, affordable housing uh, plan? I'm wondering if, if someone can give, a, again, a very, very quick sort of explanation of what the CHC parcel program is exactly, how it functions, and then if it's, it has a role uh, moving forward. Okay. It doesn't really count um, on the state's um, uh, docket. So what, what is it exactly, Maggie? It's a home ownership program. Okay. The, the um, housing corp owns the land okay. on which the houses either already exist or are built by the person who takes on the 99 year lease of that land. And then the house is built and the property owner pays property tax on the house and has all the privileges of anybody else in town living there, subject to lease provisions, which um, prevent certain things. Um, since it's uh, a, a pr parcel program, houses can be built on um, smaller than otherwise permitted lots. You can build 
if the, the housing corp can build a house on a one acre lot, whether it's in a one acre zone, a three acre zone or a five acre zone. So it kind of increases the density in that way. Um, so there are various um, restrictions on what a parcel program homeowner can do since it's already a higher density dwelling. Okay. Yeah. So that so that's not, sorry. So it's not necessarily something that features prominently in the new plan or yeah i mean it, it doesn't feature it doesn't feature prominently i mean we did we do have a recommendation of sort of encouraging as one of our 15 strategies to encourage private landowners to grant affordable housing comes basically to grant land to the Cornwall housing corporation more generally part of that could be for the parcel um for the parcel program and 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 you know this the revolving loan fund that we're um exploring setting up Again, one of one of the goals could be to provide down payment assistance for the purchasers of um, of parcel program homes. Okay. So it's sort of it, it's related, and right. um, but, but it's kind of de facto affordable, even though it doesn't count mm -hmm. as a uh, capital A affordable to the state because um, to be to get into the parcel program you're allowed to earn up to 100% of county median. It used to be 80%, but then people started having, you know, home ownership is more expensive than renting. And people started having problems staying afloat and we altered our income limits for that reason. And that took us out of the state um, count, counting for the state 10%, right. which is, as we all know, totally arbitrary and not really. Yeah, and we didn't, I mean, you know, I mean, on, on the one hand, we certainly do aim to, you know, we aim to sort of produce 10 more units that sort of officially count as affordable, but I think um, we we aim to sort of boost the supply of, of, um, of, of housing and, and sort of more attainable housing more generally, regardless of whether that, and, and housing that could help to, to enhance the diversity of Cornwall, regardless of whether those units officially counted or not, we still thought this is this is we thought about you know what's going to be good for Cornwall. Okay, there's a there's a sort of a nuanced question here um, about uh, public um, uh, public funding, um, and it is does the does the any of the funding or loan programs in the Cornwall housing program provide a way to finance and build or renovate an existing housing that is a mix. Of affordably priced and market rate um, uh, options, so I'm assuming that means you know either you know a, a fully rental property at market value plus an affordable apartment married to the same property, something along those lines. Maybe that's a question that is yet to be answered in the thinking of. Well, the yeah, I don't know whether I mean, does the housing corporation have any? We don't. We don't have, have any. Um thing that fits that but that's the kind of thing I mean we haven't talked about the state statute that um that created this uh kind of arbitrary 10 percent number but that state statute which is called 830g mm -hmm. um says that in any town that is not already providing 10 percent affordable housing, a developer can come to the town and um, create a and, and get through planning and zoning a um, development plan which provides for 30% affordable units in his subdivision. Um, and only having to satisfy state requirements about health, safety, and welfare. In other words, he can sort of uh, cruise by various other local zoning regulations. And that bugbear has not been um, 
a real threat in Cornwall because it's not conducive to this sort of development that any uh, sane private developer would attempt because of, I think we talk about it in the affordable housing mm -hmm. plan, right? Because of lack of infrastructure and things like that. But that is a tool that a developer can use and it can also be used by um, housing groups such as Cornwall Housing. Mm -hmm. If there are things called friendly 830 um, applications, if a, if a town, not like perfect Cornwall, but towns in our area, which are getting um, just a ridiculous pushback for not defensible reasons, um, can just waltz in and say, okay, we're, we'll do an 830 and we've satisfied health, safety and welfare and please grant us the permit. But All right. you know, I mean, that's mostly, how 10% yeah, published. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that's where, and the 10%, so, I mean, the, you know, the law that, that Maggie's talking about is really, was really aimed at exclusionary suburbs, right? right. That were, that right. were really sort of locking their gates and saying no to every housing proposal, every affordable housing proposal and every mixed income housing proposal. And so the idea was this gave them, those developers, an ability to, for, um, you know, uh, to, to to appeal local zoning board de de um, denials and and uh, and then the burden falls on the municipality to to show that the denial was justified based on um, health and safety concerns and and if it wasn't then then that development can go through but but just I mean it's like I said I mean in, in, I think this law was passed and it was passed in the late 1980s so in the more than 30 years that that law has been in place no developers ever brought an 830G challenge in Cornwall because it's just it, it's and it's just not going to happen. Um, very very unlikely to happen here given the the infrastructure limitations. And, and so I think you know again, the aim to for our aim the plan and you know is not our 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 goal to sort of build more housing in Cornwall is not to avoid such developer appeals. It's not sort of to be defensive. It's really about, you know, about keeping Cornwall open to, to households with a range of incomes. Um, I think that uh, one question that's sort of, that's come up uh, in a direct way is just about accessory apartments, accessory units, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of probably one of your more uh, sort of organic uh, recommendations to the town. Um, th this individual asked about um, whether they could house younger people or generations of non-relatives and all that's sort of in the works, right? There is new thinking about accessory apartment um, uh, acceptability, right? Could we just touch a little bit on what the changes that have been taking place on that front? I, th I think it's really <clears throat> um, a little premature to talk about that because they're, they, the, the new legislation that um, makes uh, certain things about accessory apartments um, different from the way they are now is under consideration by planning and zoning currently. So I think I should leave that right. to them. Yeah, but, I mean, we did have in the plan, I'll just say sort of at a general level, right, and we included in our yeah. plan sort of two of our recommendations touch on accessory dwelling units, which basically are sort of, um, you know, structures that are built on secondary structures that are built on the same parcel, they can either be attached to the existing structure, or they're sort of standalone units and that they have their own kitchen facilities. Um, or they can be, um, you know, uh, ex external structures, but on, on the same parcel. And, and there's been a movement around the country to sort of embrace ADUs. I mean, California has most, most notably um, basically made um, ADUs uh, legal as of right, sort of without any special permits across the entire state. Um, and, um, but so, so we basically recommended that, um, we recommended that the town make um, the creation of, of these accessory dwelling units or ADUs simpler. 
Um, and really, we, we didn't get into the, the details of how to make them simpler. But right now, for instance, I think it's right that they, they can't be more than 1,200 feet. They have to be, they have to go through a special um, permit in order, if you want to build one, you have to go get a special approval. And you, you, it's only, um, the option's only available to sort of owner, owner occupants. And so, um, and, then, and then we also talked about, um, we, we recommended that, um, that we basically lobby the state to count um, these accessory dwelling units at least as 50% of, of an affordable unit. In, in, the, in the accounting of those, you know, getting to the 10% that, that accessory dwelling units are counted as half a unit. Got it. You mentioned uh, sort of size there for a second, and I just wanted to um, to touch on one question that came in a little bit before the chat was <clears throat> just about is there a is there a way to help ensure that some of the affordable housing that's created is uh, family friendly and family occupiable? So sort of multi room, you know, places with outdoor space, something where a family would not just sort of grow for two years, but could sort of, you know, grow for 10 or 15, you know, something like that. Is that something that you guys looked at at all? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we didn't talk about that that much, but I think it's a really, it's a really good point. And I think it's something certainly for the Cornwall Housing Corporation to consider when, um, thinking about, you know, whatever, when, when uh, targeting developments and to think about what's the right balance of unit sizes. I mean, I think that our aim was both to make Cornwall more affordable to, to families and also make Cornwall more affordable to seniors who want to age in place here. I think also on the, you know, for, for PNZ and for accessory dwelling units, I think that's another point is that, you know, if, if you, if you limit accessory dwelling units, if you make them, you know, really small, then that's going to be um, difficult for families to live there. Then it's going to become an option for, for um, a more viable option for, for households without kids. So I, I think thinking about that's, you know, one reason maybe to think about sort of, you know, allowing for somewhat more flexibility in, in the size of units. Okay. In, in the parcel program, for example, um, uh, when people are going to get um, septic plans and everything, they're obliged to put in a four bedroom septic, three, three to four bedroom septic, so that it, even if it's a small family that moves in, it's, it's expandable for the next um, family who may live there. Um, there is a, uh, there is a question, there's two, sort of two questions, one that I just kind of skipped over, which is, um, I, it's a very general question, and it's just, is it even possible to build a new home that will qualify for affordable housing? And I'm assuming that has to do with uh, construction costs currently, and mm -hmm. land prices, and, you know, is that a real thing, you know, is a set of five we houses or whatever it is, is that a practicable, um, you know, format for affordable housing or is it all have to be, is any new construction necessarily um, multi-unit buildings? In your I mean, opinion, I mean, obviously there's a lot, this is not a cleanly answerable question, but. I think that, you're talking about could you build a, a single family affordable house? Is was that, that the question? Seems to be the gist of that specific yeah. question. I think I think if you if you were given the land and if you were very strategic in your planning and you had uh, you know lots of our houses were built by the owners. I mean they weren't just owner built by a hiring, they were owner built by swinging the hammer or having a handy friends and things like that. Um, it's obviously 100% harder than it was two years ago to do that. Yeah, when, it's in, hard to do. It's hard to build. I mean, it, it depends again, it, what sort of income level you're talking about. If you're talking about sort of deeply affordable units, you're going to need subsidies. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
and then you know the the only is I think we've covered all the questions so far in the in the um, in the chat. But Brian Cristaldi um, is asking, you know, uh, and it's, it, I think it's a very clear answer. Is there a relation? Is there a relationship <laughs> to keeping young people in town um, and housing and uh, also employment? I think that's a sort of he's asking. Is there a relationship? I think obviously there is. I'm wondering if you have a sense of, you know, it, you know, is it, it, is the idea that affordable housing is sort of meaningless anyway, if there's not more employment or does affordable housing open up the opportunity for different kinds of employment? What do you think that relationship is? I think, I think every business in town has a sign in the window saying help wanted. And if you um, follow the, the chat site, Every other day, somebody is saying, where can I find somebody to do a such and such? Um, uh, and those are people who used to live down the road from you. You know, gone forever or maybe gone temporarily. They'll come back. Yeah, I mean, there, there's sort of I mean, this gets to sort of the economic development case for sort of affordable housing is that, you know, you need it, which you, know, you need. A, a housing that's affordable to the to a range of income so that you can mm -hmm. have a support a diversity of workers in your community so right. I mean that may be more of sort of a regional issue than it is sort of a Cornwall specific issue but um, but it's really really important right and, and and if you don't do that what are you gonna, you're gonna have people sort of just suffering un unsustainable commutes which are incredibly difficult for them but also environmentally costly for for the rest of us um uh new question just about um uh someone's made an observation that in the boston area single family <clears throat> units get condoized quite a bit into uh, uh multifamily use is that the kind of, is that sort of a uh a path for uh multiple ownership of single properties in cornwall or is there an issue with that I don't know how that fits into zoning, whether there's anything in zoning that controls that. At present, if you live in a house that's big and more than 15 years old, um, you can have three or four dwelling units within that house, according to zoning. And I can, um, split, that, and I can split that ownership, is what you're saying. I could have I three I know deep. about the split ownership. It's yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good three. question. That's a yeah. good question. I mean, I, yeah. I think that the the idea was that it would be sort of the that one of those units. I mean, it, it's yeah, right now the rule is right that the, the homes, it's limited to homes that are more than 15 years old and it's limited and at least one of the units has to be, it basically the, it has to be owner occupied. So um, it has to be sort of like a landlord rental. Right. Yeah, it's, but I don't know about this. A, multiple it's a, ownership. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I think that's, I mean, one of the, one of the sort of strategies that is sort of in our, in our second bucket of sort of the gentle density increases is to sort of make it easier for people. I mean, why should it only be homes that are more than 15 years old? What if you have a newer home? Why can't you split that up into, and it's a it's a great way to sort of create more housing without um, you know it's it's cheaper. You're using an existing structure, and and you're obviously not changing the 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 built environment, or, you know, at all, at all by doing that. Okay. Yeah, there are other problems though. Um, I can remember about 25 years ago when a bunch of us were um, sort of wondering what was going to become of our parents and um, why they didn't like the, the setups that we would arrange for them and everything. And we all talked about how superior we were going to be about um, plans for our old age and that we would just get together and all live in one house that we had and all have our separate areas. And immediately we started arguing about whose house it was going to be. <laughs> So there do have to be ground rules. Could bring back the original Yelping Hill, right? With uh, right, exactly. one big kitchen and a bunch of bungalows, right? And yeah. measure affordable housing. Um, but look, I think the point is, is like, I think allowing for that kind of flexibility is really important. I mean, yeah. it, it, it both enhances affordability, gives people choice. And it's like, you know, but that's, it, we should just let people live 
in you know in the configurations that they want to that they want to live in and and that's likely we should make that more flexible we shouldn't have rules prohibiting it and um and that's going to enhance affordability create more housing i think um when, uh, this is just sort of sort of my question i guess is when i hear that kind of flexibility it sounds exciting on one hand and yet i get nervous right that if the more flexibility and the more you know i think the the derogatory term would be loosey goosey uh, of regulations, the more I think people or developers in particular could take advantage of that and impact the, you know, the aesthetics of the community that you moved into because of that, right? So, I mean, is there, how do you sort of balance that? Is, is it something that is a myth? Is it, is it a boogeyman that I should not be nervous about or is it uh, something that has to be watched with each step? Maggie, you want to start on that one? <laughs> then I'll... Well, um, let's set up an aesthetic committee to govern what happens with uh, market rate houses, right? Nobody, nobody um, controls how people add on and giganticize or um, deal with the environment um, on that side of the scale. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is. I mean, so far, uh, developing affordable housing just hasn't appealed to people who don't have some connection to the town that could change, but it just doesn't seem to be advantageous enough for them. Hmm. Yeah. But I don't yeah. know. What do you think? Ingrid? I think that's right. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's again, as we said, it's sort of like the, just the, the infrastructure costs, the inadequate infrastructure is just going to, we're not, it's just very unlikely that we're going to see sort of large related is not going to come into Cornwall and try to build a, you know, a Hudson Yards and whatever. And, in uh, in in Cornwall Bridge, um, but but I think that but 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 let me say sort of more seriously because I because I think that the most significant concern that I hear from folks is that um, is this sort of concern that building how do we build more housing here, Maggie and I and we're all talking about building more housing. Well, how do we do that without threatening Cornwall's rural landscape, right? And mm -hmm. and and threatening conservation goals. And 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 I think actually, I mean, I think that it's really important to understand or that a lot of the, the increases in housing that, um, that are going to happen, that, that we hope will happen um, and be facilitated through this plan and through, through planning and zoning are gonna be gentle, what, what Maggie called invisible density, right? These are gonna be, these are gonna be new, new homes that are in existing buildings, they're in barns, they're in accessory structures like garage apartments. And, and these housing units additions are gonna increase supply enhance affordability without ever really being noticed or undermining the rural landscape. So, so that's number one, right? We really can, we can build more housing even in our existing structures or on sort of existing parcels that um, in ways that um, will look very much like the existing built environment in Cornwall. But, but um, uh, secondly, right, building some density actually can actually it can actually, um, you know, uh, support conservation if if planned smartly. Support environmental conservation because if you think about it, if we can all live in somewhat sort of smaller areas, if we decide that this is this these are the parts of Cornwall that we're going to build on, then we're going to leave room to accommodate actually both population growth and and environmental conservation and, and preservation of the rural landscape that, that we also love. So, so I think that density and conservation are not, they're, they're often sort of pitted against one another, but I think they really shouldn't be. They're really not substitutes, they're actually complementary. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, let's see, um, we are, it is six o'clock. So that is our, that is sort of our official end time. Although I know we have a few more minutes is there, uh, sorry, hold on one second here. I'm being prodded, Ed Green's question, hold on. 
Uh, so, yeah, um, I, this had to do with uh, remote working um, and how that might affect um, uh, what might be the effect if remote working becomes more established, uh, which might be likely uh, as many employees, uh, employers, um, at least uh, a percentage of working days. So I, I don't know, I think that's sort of the idea of you know, what, how is the, the nature of income changing a little bit? How does that affect what, are, what you guys are planning? Are you thinking about that? You actually were sort of in the middle of this plan when the work from home phenomena mm -hmm. began actually, right? You were sort of in the thick of it. Um, it was changing as you were going. I mean, I think it exacerbates, it has exacerbated the affordability challenges and okay. Cornwall. I mean, that's what sort of Maggie said, right? It's sort of, you know, COVID really has and 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 the work from home. I mean, there are going to be more people who are higher income professional workers who who want to, you know, enjoy Cornwall's environment while while working remotely. And so it, and it's, it's going to be good for the school for sure, mm -hmm. because it'll bring more children in. And um, the good thing about our big houses and the um, point of view that Cornwall has historically held towards affordable housing is that it's entirely possible that people will put in an accessory apartment or something and have uh, that be inhabited by somebody who provides some service to that family as well as say works on the outside. Um, there, th historically, there have been, um, you know, a vast number of righteous landlords in town who aren't there to maximize the possible income they can derive from extra living space. And I see that as continuing. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I think Anna Tamel has done an informal uh, prowl through um, building um, inspector records and zoning records and thinks that there may be, um, you know, a rather huge number of affordable I mean, of accessory apartments already in existence, whether they've uh, gone through the up till now required permitting um, process. And those are all obviously inhabited by people who are able to live at a reasonable rate in town. And mm -hmm. long may that wave. <laughs> um. So uh, look, I mean, uh, Ingrid or Maggie, is there something that you wanted to sort of touch on that you think we skipped over or some an important, important point for people to know that maybe we didn't yeah. touch on? I mean, or is a stumper. I, I would just say one, one more thing, which is that I, I think that one thing that we didn't talk about, every, everything we've talked about is sort of on the, is on the, what, the supply side of sort of how to expand the supply of housing, but we also included what what um, I think I I think is a is a is an important recommendation on on more the demand side, which is is help in, in helping people find and, and afford um, uh, housing in in Cornwall, and we suggested that the town consider. Um, uh, basically hiring a, a housing coordinator who would help um, help people kind of navigate people who are having trouble finding housing seeing if they can help them match them to maybe somebody who does have an accessory dwelling unit and might be interested in renting it out and might they may help that person find different sources of of housing support they um and and so i, I think that that um you know i think that wouldn't be a full-time position but having someone part-time who's who's focused on really helping people with their housing needs um, is also an important part of the plan. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I wanted to sort of just sort of, uh, sort of ask and add a little bit about 
uh, again, I think that this sort of being able to sort of do multi, um, you know, multi dwellings in a single um, from a single house is, is, is an important step also because it also sort of offsets mortgages, right? So if you're, if you're purchasing a house and you know that there's a possibility or maybe even incentive to um, have a, a multifamily unit, you can purchase that house and know that the mortgage has, um, you know, you, you have help with a mortgage. I think that that flexibility is, is a good thing on that front too. It's something that in New York, people are very aware of, obviously. Yeah, and same thing with accessory dwelling units, right? They can also yep. help to yep, enhance yep. the income of, of the, the occupant of the main house and, and help them to afford to live there as well. Yeah, so um, I, I think that's about it. I don't see any more sort of questions lining up. Um, and um, uh, Margaret, I don't know uh, sort of, uh, how to sort of conclude. I think we're in good shape. Um, I think we're in, I think we're in very good shape. And I, I think what's left is to thank you, uh, Maggie and Ingrid and, and you, Bill, for uh, a really important and informative conversation. Um, we had um, 80 people and they mostly all stayed. So this was something yeah. people really wanted to hear about. So Thank you very much for your time and effort in this and your expertise. And also thank you, all of you out there who joined us for this important talk. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank, thanks, Ingrid and Bill, um, Margaret, and Shari. Yeah, yes, and Shari. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Shari. My and, pleasure. And thank you. <laughs> keep, keep your questions coming, those of you, you know, don't be shy. Yeah, the That's conversation, obviously, about. obviously this conversation is going to keep going with your new committee and all sorts of talk around town. I'm sure um, there's plenty of opportunity to contribute. Thank right. you. Good night. Bye. Bye. Care.